Then go ahead and pop open your bearing kit and get the uh, races for the inner and outer pinion bearing. You'll also need a bearing race driver set. You can rent these for free at AutoZone and O'Reilly's and uh, most auto parts stores. It's always preferable to do that because you just always get beat the hell. Alright, so now go to your bearing race driver set and find the driver that fits the inner bearing best. This one probably is the one. Let's see if we go a step higher. No, no way. That's the one. Go ahead and configure the driver with the tapered end pointing outwards. All right, let's go ahead and get the race in position. And just take the driver and drive it home. Do your best to make sure it goes in flat and even. Like when it starts raising up on one side, you're gonna have to give pressure over there. There we go. Just run your finger along the back side and make sure it's flat. Yep, this one's good. And I repeat the same process for the inner bearing race. Now on this race you're going to run into a problem with the length of this driver tool. Because you're just not going to be able to get a good swing on that. Especially as it starts driving in. So what I do is just take a socket that fits over, put it on a half inch drive extension. And there you've kind of sort of made an extension for the driver. Alright, let's verify that for flatness, and it's good. Alright, now I'll go ahead and grab the pinion seal and the outer bearing from your kit. Now this step you don't necessarily have to do, I just do it because I'm paranoid. Just take a little bit of RTV, put it on the outside of this pinion seal. Now go to your bearing race driver set and find the driver that matches the diameter of the pinion seal. And you want to configure it with the flat side facing outwards, so the tapered side is pointing towards the driver. Now just go ahead and insert the outer bearing, followed immediately by the pinion seal. Now just go ahead and take the driver and gently tap it in place. And then just check that the seal is flat all the way around, and you're good. Just take a shop rag or something and clean up the axle seal surface. Get some brake cleaner. Now we're going to go ahead and install our new axle seals. These come pre greased and it gets everywhere. So I like to go ahead and clean up the outside of these before applying a small bit of RTV. You don't need much RTV at all. Very thin layer. Technically, you don't need any, but I just like to be paranoid. Now go to your bearing race driver, find the one that matches the diameter of the seal. Go ahead and set it up to where the um, face is flat, taper is facing the driver. Now just go ahead and install that new seal. Doesn't take very much pressure at all. If you feel it start to walk towards one side, just try to center pressure on the opposite side. Straighten it up. Make sure it's seated flat all the way around. And this one is good. Just 
Just repeat the same process for the other side. Just make sure the pinion bearing shim is in place. Now you're going to have to find a pipe or something that matches the uh, diameter of this inner race here. And it's got to be long enough to uh, go above the uh, pinion gear itself. You're going to need that in order for the press to press on the bearing. But just make sure whatever you use is not putting any pressure on the bearing cage. Alternatively, there is a little trick that you can use. I've actually never tried it myself and I'm kind of tempted to try it. Supposedly, if you put the pinion in the freezer overnight, and then put the bearing in the oven at 350 degrees or so for about an hour. Supposedly it just drops right on because obviously warm metal expands and cold metal shrinks and it's just enough clearance difference to allow this to slide on supposedly. So you know what? We're actually going to try that because I have plenty of time on this vehicle. Okay, I've had the bearing cooking for about an hour and a half now at 350 degrees. I've had the gear freezing for over 24 hours now. So we're going to see if this works. Got my OEM approved snap-on bearing tongs. Holy crap, it worked. <laughs> that was awesome. It's kind of scary how well that worked. It went right on. Well, I suppose you can use this trick if you don't have a press. All right, so we're going to let that gear come up to temperature before we even move this at all, because I don't want to disturb that bearing and make it come up any. Here's an important note, especially if you had a lot of damage on the carrier bearings, is to inspect this bearing surface. What could happen is a condition we call a spun bearing, where the the inner race will actually rotate and that should never ever rotate but if it does it's gonna gall up this surface here and uh, you know it's gonna knock down the thickness of it to where the carrier is gonna become unusable and the way you tell is you just run your fingernail across the surface and if it if you catch and it feels like it's dropping into a little groove when it gets to where the bearing should be sitting and that's a that's a cause for concern you have a couple of options if you do run into that you could either take the carrier to a machine shop and what they can do is just you know true it up weld it and then turn it to bring it back to the proper diameter or you can roll the dice and put some red loctite around the uh, diameter of it if you do that make sure you use the gel loctite so that the, it doesn't seep into any crevices where it shouldn't now in theory you could try the freezer trick on the carrier itself but I wouldn't recommend putting something this heavy inside of your freezer. And besides, it's easy enough to find something that you can press these onto. If you have one of the old races still intact, it makes the perfect tool for pressing on the new bearing. I'm going to go ahead and set it up like this. Now these bearings actually have to seat below the mating surface. It's kind of an oddball design, so you're gonna have to stop and check. And yeah, see that's flush, so we gotta go past flush. So let's recenter our driving race. Let's carefully put this plate back on. There we go. All right, there we go. Now just repeat the same process for the other bearing. Go ahead and get some gear oil on every bearing. Just a thin coat, you don't have to go crazy. Just make sure they're not dry. All right, so now we're gonna do a mock install. So we're gonna go ahead and set the pinion gear in place as well as the carrier and, and everything and all the appropriate shims. What we're not going to do is we're not gonna put the crush sleeve on yet. We're doing this just to get an idea of what our contact pattern is, making sure it's still good or if we need to make adjustments. And you don't want to waste your crush sleeve because you can only install these once. So go ahead and take the old nut because you don't want to use the new one for this. Before we proceed, let's go ahead and reinstall this carrier pin. We're not going to be putting the axle shafts in just yet, so we want to put this in just to keep our spider gears from moving all over the place.
All right, go ahead and take your pinion. Sands the crush sleeve. Just get it to where it'll stay. You don't want to put too much pressure on this right now because then you'll just push your seal out. So go ahead and reach down to the other side and just try to guide that outer bearing into place. There we go. There, at least it'll stay. All right, I'll go ahead and take the yoke. As well as the used pinion nut. And let's go ahead and crank it down. Now you've got to find a way to keep the hub from turning. And you have a couple options here. Like I mentioned during removal, you could take a giant pipe wrench and just attach it to the yoke and then find something where that'll fetch up on. Or you could take one of these pulley holding tools and a couple of the um, U-joint cap bolts. Tighten them down, and now it'll just hit the ground, provide you with all the counter rotation you need. These are such handy tools, and I've found so many alternative uses for them beyond just holding pulleys, such as this. But I'll put a link in the video description where you can buy one. They're actually pretty cheap. Now, as soon as you feel the uh, pinion nut get tight, you can go ahead and stop turning. For now, we're not necessarily too concerned about preload at this stage, just as long as the pinion's in the right position. All right, now remembering our shim stack positions that we marked, let's go ahead and take some grease or something, put it on the uh, one of the shim stacks that you're going to be installing. You don't have to worry; the grease is petroleum-based, and it'll just dissolve in the gear oil. You really just want that to stay in place while you handle the carrier. All right now go ahead and take the carrier bearing races, get them on. Now you gotta get the carrier up in there while holding the races in place. It's not the easiest thing to do while you're on the ground, but what are you gonna do? Alright, now once that's in place, try to get as much room as you can on the other side where you haven't put the shim stack on yet. At this point you can go ahead and install the bearing cap on the side where you put the shim stack. Remembering of course what side it was on and the original orientation of it. Basically you just want that to hold in place for right now while you get this side's shim stack in place. I just want to take a second to show you why you want to use a tool like this shim driver instead of just beating on the shim stack with a hammer or whatever, what have you. As the uh, person who previously was in this rear end clearly did in many, many spots. Just a uh, absolute mess. See, when you beat on these things, it, it creates high spots. And, the you know, the idea of shims uh, is you're changing the thickness at the uh, ends of each uh, bearing race. Well, if you're causing the shim metal to mushroom out at the top, then guess what? You're changing the preload and all sorts of other things. The shim driver is designed to contour to the shim to try to spread out the hammering force over as large a surface as possible. And that greatly reduces the amount of damage. So I actually had to take this and take a, a cutting tool and grind down all the high spots that were caused by whoever beat this thing to death. But seriously, you should definitely be using one of these because they're only like $15. And you're going to spend more than that once you've destroyed the shim stack and cracked the bearing race and all that trying to use a punch or whatever. And I'll put a link in the video description where you could buy one of these.
Alright, now go ahead and oil up the shim stack that you're going to be driving in just to help it slide because not only does this set the carrier position it also sets the carrier bearing preload for both bearings and that's a lot of force to put on one little shim stack got the carrier in with one cap in loosely in place you don't want to tighten that yet because this thing's still got to move even if a little bit just take your pry tool get that bearing kind of in the position You're never going to get it perfectly in position, obviously, because it's a conical bearing. You just want to make enough space to get the shim stack in there, ready for hammering. Get your shim driver in place, get a big beefy hammer. Now, once the shim stack won't move any further, you can go ahead and put that side's bearing cap on. Alright, now go ahead and torque these bearing cap bolts down. 60 foot-pounds. Now your kit should have come with some gear marking compound and a brush to apply it with. What you want to do is take that and coat at least three gear teeth on both sides. Make sure you get a nice thick coat on there. Alright, once you got those gears coated, just go ahead and run the differential. Make sure you get a, at least three passes past the pinion gear. I like to go in both directions. All right, now you want to look at both sides of the gear. What you're looking for is you want the contact patch to be, you know, in the middle of both sides as best as possible. And what I've got here is a perfectly acceptable pattern. I won't be needing to make any adjustments to the shim stacks. Now, if you're absolutely 100% certain that nobody's ever messed with a differential before, and they've never played with the shim stacks or anything, and you're not changing gears and all that, then you really could skip the checking the contact pattern, but if you have the gear paint, um, you might as well do it. Another thing I like to verify is what we call the backlash. And what that is, is the very minute amount of clearance between the ring and the pinion gear. If you move the ring gear ever so slightly, you'll feel a tiny amount of space that has to be taken up, and that is absolutely critical. On these differentials, that should be uh, about ten thousandths of an inch, and this one looks like it's pretty much that. These tools are pretty cheap, and you really do find a lot of uses for them. Alright, now I'm going to go ahead and take this thing back apart. Uh-oh. There's the quality inspector. All right, now we got the pinion back out, so we're gonna clean off all this gear marking compound. Because you better believe I'm gonna check the pattern again when it's finally assembled. Doesn't have to be perfectly clean; it's just gotta be enough to not interfere with the second marking. Now it's time to talk about the bane of the existence of anyone who works on a GM differential, and that's called the crush sleeve. Crush sleeve sits in between the inner bearing and the outer bearing and it provides preload. And the way you set the preload is by literally crushing the crush sleeve and that's done by tightening of the pinion nut. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get through. If you really wanted to, you can buy something called a crush sleeve eliminator kit. That's literally just a spacer and some shim stacks. And you just kind of use those to find where your preload is correct. No crushing required. Crush sleeve eliminator kit has a few more advantages than a crush sleeve. With the eliminator kit you can remove and reinstall the pinion nut as much as you like. Whereas with the crush sleeve you can really only do that once because they can only be crushed once. For my purposes I'm just gonna run my regular crush sleeve. Let's just go ahead and get that on the pinion. Let's make sure that outer bearing has oil on it. 
All right, make sure the crush sleeve stays in place while you insert the pinion for final assembly. Let's make sure that pinion seal has plenty of grease on it. Otherwise, you run the risk of burning it out very quickly. Also, I like to just go ahead and grease the sealing surface of the yoke as well. Now, I generally don't use Loctite on pinion nuts. You absolutely have to use a brand new nut because if you look very carefully, you see the very end of that is kind of knackered in order to create resistance on these last few threads. And that's what locks the nut on. It is a lock nut. So you really don't need Loctite, unless you're super paranoid, which even as paranoid as I am, I don't worry about putting Loctite on these. Alright, got our pulley holding tool installed. Now it's time to get a massive arm workout. You might be tempted to use impact for this, but you really shouldn't. Because it just as soon as you over crush that crush sleeve, you're screwed and you gotta start all over. Now once the crush sleeve has started to crush, it takes a lot of torque to get it past its first initial crushing point. In that situation, there's no shame in getting help from old Jack. If you can still move the pinion back and forth, and you hear that, that means you haven't even begun to start crushing the crush sleeve yet. But once you've reached the point where there is no lash in moving the pinion back and forth, then you have to approach the tightening process very slowly, because you don't want to go past the point where you, the, within the uh, preload specification. So after just about every bite you take out of the tightening process, take a pause and check the preload. Alright, in order to measure the pinion bearing preload, you're going to need an inch pound torque wrench like this. This is one with a very low torque range, so it only goes up to 80 inch pounds. That's perfect for checking bearing preload. Alright, now when you measure the preload, you want to measure it after the yoke starts moving. You don't want to measure the uh, amount it takes to break away, because that's always going to be high. What you want to measure is the amount of torque it takes to keep the pinion moving. The appropriate pinion bearing preload for these axles with new bearings is 14, 19 inch pounds. Now there's no carrier or anything installed yet, it's just the pinion. But that preload I'm happy with, so I can go ahead and continue final assembly. Alright, before you assemble the diff any further, just make sure to clean off any old RTV or gasket material from the ceiling surface. Alright, after final assembly, I'm still happy with that contact pattern. So, we are good to continue reassembling. And I'm still happy with the backlash. Not gonna mess with it. Let's go ahead and clean off that gear marking compound. At this point, you can go ahead and remove the center retaining pin. Go ahead and put some gear oil on the axle bearings. Alright, now you're ready to insert the axle shaft. Very carefully, so that you don't damage the seal. Now you gotta kind of pick up on the axle shaft and kind of find where it goes into the carrier. There we go. And then you should feel the splines lock in. Just a little bit of back and forth. Now you want to get your C-clamp on the end of the axle shaft. Alright, once you've got it in there, just reach over and pull on the axle shaft to get it inside the gear, and that side's done. 
then get the C-clip on that side. There you go. Now go ahead and rotate the carrier to where you can get that retaining pin back in. Go ahead and insert the retaining pin. You might have to wiggle it because a lot of the times the spider gears will shift. There we go. You could also try to rotate one of the axles a little bit and that'll cause the spider gears to rotate. There you go. Now it's time to install the pinion lock bolt. Now thread locker is required on this bolt. You could probably get away with blue Loctite just fine. If you want to use red Loctite, just make sure you remember the next time you take this thing apart to heat this up. Otherwise you're going to snap that head right off. And because we're using thread locker, we have to make sure that both the threads on the bolt and the threads in the carrier are as clean and oil-free as possible. And for that, we turn to our good friend, Brake Cleaner. Alright, now I'll give the Brake Cleaner some time to flash off. Right, now you have to hold the carrier while you torque that bolt. That bolt gets torqued 25 foot-pounds or 300 inch-pounds. Alright, at this point the differential assembly is complete. We can go ahead and put the cover on. Alright, make sure you thoroughly clean the diff cover. Actually, this one is just absolutely disgusting. This is greatly assisted by our good friend Brake Cleaner. Get all that old RTV off. Razor blade makes quick work of it. As long as you don't slice yourself to death. Right now this step is completely optional. However, the amount of metal shavings that were in that differential have me a little bit concerned, so I decided to um, harvest a bunch of hard drive magnets. Hard drives contain these extremely strong neodymium magnets. So I'm just going to attach these to the inside of the cover here. Now despite the fact that these are extremely strong and they'll stick to this cover just fine, I want to make sure that they don't move around. So I'm going to uh, attach some RTV to the back. RTV is silicone and it makes excellent adhesive. And I want the magnets to be inside of the fluid, so I'm going to put them on the lower part. However, I'm going to avoid the section where the ring gear goes, because I'm not sure how much clearance I have between the ring gear and the cover. wipe that excess RTV off. You're probably asking yourself why am I putting these on the inside rather than the outside of the cover? And the answer to that is if you're on the outside of the cover they could easily get knocked off and if that happens then all the metal shavings that they've collected just go right back into the fluid and they've done you no good at all. I'd rather take the unlikely risk that they get loose and get, get chewed up by the gears. I'm gonna be doing a short oil change on this thing anyway just because of the amount of metal shavings I found in there. Now since I am doing a short oil change on this, I'm going to use an actual gasket. Ordinarily I would just put a bead of silicone all along the ceiling flange. And that's what I will do once I've done this short oil change. Because I, I just prefer the RTV over a gasket. Uh, it just seems to me that gaskets are more likely to leak. Alright, let's take our cover. Yeah, I picked the windiest day possible to do this. I like to start at the top bolt. Take some shifting around, but... And get a second bolt in somewhere. Alright, go ahead and get all ten bolts in, but don't tighten any one of them yet. Remember that this bolt here also holds this brake line bracket in. Alright, now go ahead and torque these bolts down to 20 foot-pounds or 240 inch-pounds. And you want to do crisscross pattern. So once you've torqued one bolt down, then you torque the one that's furthest from it. Alright, now it's time to fill the differential with fluid. And if you used RTV as your gasket, you're going to want to wait a couple hours for that to vulcanize before you add oil. And since this is a positive traction G80 rear, I'm going to be using the full synthetic with the uh, limited slip additive. 
and basically it couldn't be any simpler. You just fill it with fluid until fluid starts oozing out of the fill hole. All right, that's one quart down. All right, second quart down. All right, there we go. Now at this point, you want to give it a minute because that gear oil has to fill the axle tubes. And gear oil is very thick. Obviously, that takes a little bit of time. So go ahead and let it rest for a second, and then top it off. It helps to speed up the process to go ahead and rotate the axle shafts. Kind of draws the fluid in, kind of sorta. All right, this diff took a grand total of three quarts. And after I take it for its first drive, I'm going to go ahead and top it off again. I'll go ahead and install the fill plug. <clears throat> At this point, I like to just go ahead and run the diff by hand. That way, everything gets coated in gear oil. All right, go ahead and get them installed. All right, now we're going to go ahead and service the uh, caliper slide pins. These are pretty nasty, so we're going to renew the grease and all. If you have one that won't pull off, don't twist it, because then you'll wreck the, the grease boot. Just take a screwdriver and carefully pry it down. Pry it out of the lip. All right, take a rag soaked and brake cleaner. off the old grease or what's left of it and take some silicone brake lubricant just coat the slide pin with it put a thin layer where the boots gonna seat so that it slides into position easily also like to put a ball of grease inside but don't put too much in there because you could create a clearance problem with the actual slide pin all right just go ahead and rotate it as you insert it so that the grease gets nicely distributed all right, go ahead and clean up the excess. Repeat that process for all of the rest of the slide pins. All right, let's go ahead and reinstall the brake caliper bracket. As you're tightening the brake caliper bracket bolts, do your best to keep the bracket from moving around and banging against the rotor. Alright, torque those caliper bracket bolts down to 122 foot-pounds. Inspector's back. Everybody look busy. Alright, now you can go ahead and slap the new pads on. Start with the uh, bottom ear. Just insert it and then at the top, slide it in. Same thing for the rear. Now in most cases you're kit will come with a pad with the wear indicator on only two of the pads. And that's because you only need one wear indicator per wheel. So just make sure you don't put both of the pads with the wear indicator on the same wheel. Alright, now you have to retract the caliper piston. So take one of the old brake pads and a C-clamp and just slowly force the piston back in. Alright, at this point you can go ahead and install the caliper. Make sure that the brake hose goes on exactly the way it came off. Make sure it's not twisted or kinked or anything. All right, get on the uh, slide pins and compress them in. Start the slide pin bolts. Just like you did during removal, take a wrench and hold the uh, slide pin. Keep it from turning while you tighten the bolt. And these get torqued 28 foot-pounds. All right, at this point, you can go ahead and put the wheel back on. All right, now go ahead and reinsert into the transmission or transfer case. And rotate the pinion, get the bearing caps in position. Make sure both caps are seated flush in the yoke. And then just go ahead and install the bolts and the straps. And torque these bolts down to at least 180 inch pounds. Just do one cap at a time. Remember, the track bar bolt has this captive nut here. 
that goes on the back. And there's probably a good chance that the bolt hole's not going to line up anymore. So what you can do is take your foot, find somewhere solid on the rear axle, and then brace your arm on the frame somewhere, and then just move the axle far enough to get the bolt in. At that point, you can just take a pry bar right behind the track bar. There you go. Now take the captive nut, get it on the bolt, torque it down. I don't know what the torque spec is on this bolt, but just make it tight, but don't strip it out. All right, now you have to reconnect the sway bar. Just get one side at a time. Gears came off. Make sure you reinstall these e brake cable clips. And this truck is supposed to have two, but one is missing, so I have to find another one. And since you messed with the brakes, you're gonna have to pump up the pedal until it starts to feel firm. The reason for that is when you compress the caliper pistons, it forces all the brake fluid out of them. So you have to pump that fluid back in, otherwise when you go to drive, you're going to go to step on the pedal and you'll have no pedal. And that's just not good for anyone. And that's it. You're done. Put the wheels back on and take the vehicle for about 20 minutes of light city driving. And then take it home and let it cool down completely. And it helps to do that about two or three times. Avoid hard acceleration and towing for several days. Especially if you install new gears. And change the fluid in about 500 miles or so. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.